there's this 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 narrative that's being generated and i feel like rittenhouse among so many others are just figures within this broader narrative which we alluded to earlier and i think these uh these grifters that we mentioned earlier like greenwald are helping because it's dividing the left to a great degree as well i think it's helping kind of cement the right wing's agenda in many ways i think that they're they're serving that so I guess, yeah, th- this is what I really wanted to point to in this thing that you talked about yeah. in your interview with Chris Hedges, and I thought this was a very valuable point because I'm seeing legislation being passed in states all across the U.S. where it does feel like we're living in two different countries. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I'm from southern Idaho. I moved up to northern Washington just about three months ago. I know that you travel between two different cities, and you've mentioned yep. this as well, like just with covid mm-hmm. Yep. how it's treated it's a, oh, it's a completely different mm-hmm. world I, living in idaho it's as if it didn't exist of course it did the icus yeah. were completely packed for months mm-hmm. we had crisis standards of care and icus in idaho mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. for months yeah. yeah so it's very real but people didn't treat it as if it was real i would be the mm-hmm. only one wearing a mask in a in a crowd and coming to washington where it's actually treated as if it is real even right. if people right. can be occasionally lax about it Nonetheless, it's much more common to see people taking yeah. it seriously. So my my point in saying that is that it just feels more and more legislatively, culturally, we've always had a cultural divide in the United States, but it just feels like really we are reaching some critical moment here. And so I really want to talk about that and how sure, sure, sure. How like what the direction you feel is we're going in. I mean, you can just speak at least legislatively across the U.S. and what yeah, that means well, for you, the elections. Yeah, well, you mentioned a few things in there that I want to uh, I want to um, uh, uh, chime in along, which is the normalization of violence. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've never seen anything like it. It is the, the election officials at the local level, at the county level, and at the state level, particularly in red states, not exclusively in red states. Now, just routinely get death threats. Uh, public health officials now routinely get death threats. School board officials, I think largely over vaccine issues, but sometimes even over the insane claim that critical race theory is being taught to kindergartners and first graders in local school districts, get violent harassment and get, uh, and get death threats. Uh, the one that really got me lately was school nurses. I was listening to the radio the other day and school nurses are under attack. Well, why? School nurses, uh, you know, make the calls to parents when one kid tests positive for 19, then they do the contact tracing and they start calling people and said, you need to know that your kid was in contact with blah, blah, blah. And they get cussed at and they get yelled at and they get screamed at. You know, store managers, uh, uh, the new pie co-op in Iowa City just decided to let a few people go around maskless because that risk was considered less than the risk of teeing off some people who will come back at you with guns. You know, yeah. and, and you hear this all the time, you hear about retail Store clerks. Um, so that's really going on. Uh, um, one thing to keep bear in mind too about the violence is that's afoot and that the right wing is promoting is the vigilante nature of some of the violence. These were vigilantes in Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, all these uh, vigilantes supposedly there to protect property in Kenosha. This is these are these are they were not actually state people. This insane uh, uh, um, bill uh, that was passed in Texas, SB eight is actually sort of in a vigilante style as an end run around Roe v. Wade, empowering people privately to sue anybody. And by the way, this is, they can do this anywhere in the country to sue anybody involved in any, in any way uh, with an abortion in that state. A lot of legal observers have made a um, analogy between that and the Fugitive Slave Act uh, uh, of 1850, which empowered you know, mm-hmm. private actors to go up into northern states and physically as vigilantes haul them back. And, you know, on the red state thing, you're absolutely right. I'm back and forth between um, Chicago and Iowa City and the different worlds that you cross into. And, you know, Iowa, by the way, it's just really awful, too. It's sort of underestimated, maybe because it just has three million people, but it's really extraordinary. It's not a southern state and it, and it goes beyond a lot of southern states. In, in the depth and the degree of the right-wing legislation it has passed, and the, and the Republicans are in complete trifecta control of Des Moines. It's just astonishing. But when I cross from um, Illinois across the Mississippi River on an Amtrak train into Iowa, I go from a state where, uh, um, where well, 
well, I mean, I'm mainly in Chicago. I don't spend a lot of time in the interim <laughs> between. Let's just say Chicago. When I go from Chicago to Iowa, I go from a place where teachers are in the public schools are going to talk honestly by and large measures, certainly in black schools. My um, younger black friends tell me that they do in the, in the Chicago public schools about race and about slavery and about, and, and about that history. And it's actually now technically illegal in, in, in Iowa. It's one of like 14 states that has passed bills prohibiting Actually, critical race theory isn't in the bill, but but the way the, the basically it's it's yeah. outlawing honest discussion of, of the history of black history, of the significance of slavery and Jim Crow and racism to the rise of the country. And incidentally, this is not just uh, the bill in Iowa. It's not just K to K to 12. It's K to PhD. I mean, on public yeah. in, on public educational institutions. It, I mean, I, I'd love to see them try and enforce that at the University of Iowa history department, you know, the Iowa State, uh, you know, <laughs> English yeah. department, who knows, you know. Uh, um, so there's that. They got rid of pandemic unemployment benefits in Iowa. They didn't do that in, uh, which is just vicious and just forces people back into dead places. They didn't do that in, in uh, Illinois, Democratic state. Uh, they passed a bill that makes, uh, um, that makes it, um, makes uh, mask mandates illegal by local school districts. They've passed a bill that has uh, um, made it okay, has, has drastically upped penalties for protesters, blocking roadways in any particular kind of way, which is what people do when protests get serious, they get out in the streets, you know, and, and just, just down the line, there's an incident in Iowa at the University of Iowa that a professor wrote about in the New Yorker while they were interviewed. It just would never happen in Chicago. Well, there, that, that incident, a problem. I mean, at the University of Iowa, you can't even ask um, students as a professor to wear a mask in the classroom to practice social distancing in the classroom, uh, or or you can't even discuss COVID-19 in any kind of real substantive kind of way, and you can't even ask a kid to be masked during an office hour when they come into your your private office. I um, When I go into a grocery store in Iowa City or into a pizza place in Iowa City after I've been in Chicago for three weeks, it's like COVID culture shock. You wouldn't go in a Trader Joe's or a Jewel Osco or a Whole Foods in Chicago with the mask on. You wouldn't even think of it. You'd be, you'd be violating uh, local mandates. And uh, I went in to get a pizza from Pagliari's Pizza in Iowa City where people were just jammed in. I mean, there must have been 150 people. Yeah. I ran in there with my mask on. I, I looked at me like I was a Martian, like I yeah. was some sort of freak. No, I'm just a guy from Chicago. This is what we do. Yeah. And I got my pizza and I got the hell out of there. And I mean, I looked around and I mean, it was just, it was like being in another planet. It's just COVID cuckoo land. And so we do seem to just live uh, in, in different worlds now, you know, and, uh, and those other worlds are not quite, it's rural versus metropolitan. It's to some extent South versus North and West, but it's not as clear cut a division. You hear about partitioning and secession, but it's not 1860. We don't have one particular society and a particular mode of production called black chattel slavery inserted within the larger world capital system in the South. And then another free labor entrepreneurial pre-corporate becoming corporate capitalism in the North, you know, with a free labor ideology you know, from, from Massachusetts all the way out to Nebraska above the Mason-Dixon line in a paternalistic, uh, 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 Christo-racist uh, slave system and ideology on the other side. No, we have, it's more like Yugoslavia now, you know? And, I, you know? and that's why I held back a little bit from just making Illinois versus Iowa, because my friend Terry, who lives in rural Illinois outside of a, a, a small town called Dixon, reports that it's, it's just what I described to you in, in Iowa is very much the case in, um, you know, we call it all of Illinois outside of Chicago downstate, which is kind of silly, but that yeah. includes even, even Northern Illinois, all of downstate Illinois, out of, you know, pretty much all of small town Illinois is the same way. You go on to get, once, once you get out of Chicago, Chicago wants to tell you this, once we get out of the city, you know, and you go into a gas station, you know, uh, uh, to buy something after you fill your gas, it's just, they look at you like you're crazy when you're wearing, wearing masks. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it feels like civil war to some extent. It feels like two very, very different worlds. And um, you know, to some extent it is. Yeah. To some extent it is. I mean, I hear more people over the left side. I just don't want to live in this country with these people, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and 
And that's what they're saying on the right too. We don't, we don't want to live there. So, but how would secession look? I just, I just can't even fathom that where it's different now, you know? Yeah. It doesn't feel like that's like, obviously that's not a viable thing, but right. what I see is, this is what I want to ask about the upcoming elections, 2022, sure. 2024. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you made valu- valuable points in your writing. And in a previous interview I mentioned with Chris Hedges about how the Biden administration has ultimately, not only have they backed down or backed, backed off numerous promises that they made on their, on his campaign uh, or even at the beginning of his administration. Right. But the ways in which he's dealing with this massive in- infrastructure bill is, you know, it's failed in many big areas. Um, the Afghan pull out, pull out, excuse me, the pull out of Afghanistan yeah, withdrawal yeah. from Afghanistan has been very sloppy and not very popular. Um, his pull, his polls are not good. So again, this isn't about this isn't about him, about us kind of liking Joe Biden. But you know, the alternative is a Republican. And considering the state of the GOP right now, it would be somebody either like Trump or or Trump himself that would be elected in twenty twenty four. And we were just discussing some of the legislation in states around the U.S. and red states. So it seems to me that because the coup attempt on January sixth failed. They're now going to approach this sort of push from a different angle uh, through legislation, which is to say that they want to make sure that they stay in power and that their agenda is, uh, you know, pushed further and further. Uh, which to me is a it's a form of authoritarianism, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I'm kind of rambling. Well, bear here, in but, mind yeah. that the um, the January sixth riot, the Capitol riot itself, was in many ways a last ditch. Hail Mary, mm-hmm. after what was hoped to have been a um, more formally constitutional and legal coup could have succeeded, and it might have had it been yeah. closer. And I think the lesson of January 6th to, to a lot of them is that um, they don't want to have to go there next time. They want to rig this thing in advance. And you know, bear in mind, and no one seems to want to talk about this ever, the system is already rigged. Right. This yeah, slave owner yeah. charter from the late 18th century towards the right. I mean, every state has two senators, regardless of how many people they have. That is a huge, huge bias towards the uh, most reactionary white and right wing and rural parts of the country. I mean, my God, Wyoming has barely 600,000 people and two U.S. senators. California has about 40 million people and has two U.S. senators. So the, the right wing is drastically overrepresented in the extremely powerful upper body of Congress. The right wing is overly represented in the electoral college, which is a winner take, it's complicated. They have, one thing is, I always tell listeners, it's always interesting to try and explain the electoral college to somebody from Europe, you know, or, yeah. or some other more nationally democratic country, you know, and, and they will just laugh, they will laugh at you. So you. You consider that a democracy? We don't have majority one person, one vote election of the US president. We have an electoral college winner take all state by state electoral slate system that incorporates the overrepresentation that the Republicans enjoy in the Senate in the electoral college formula. And the electoral college formula also works in such a way as to concentrate the presidential election in just a small handful of contested states. You know, I could go on and on and on and about that. So uh, um, this time around, and this is part of a piece I wrote once called that what happens in the red states doesn't just stay in the red state. This time around, the right wing, which is much better than the Democrats and much better than progressives at understanding the importance of state level politics. State level politics really sort of tend to operate under the radar screen compared to both local politics and national politics. And the right wing and the Koch brothers and the American Legislative Exchange Council and the right-wing policy networks have known this very well. And they are further rigging the game towards the right in numerous red states in the South and West and places like Iowa across the country with voter suppression laws, which are ways that make it tougher to vote, tougher to get registered to vote, tougher to count ballots. But not only the voter suppression, which is just endemic in the red states, uh, 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 in order to um, prevent 
another Georgia and to prevent another Arizona, you know, where swing states went Democratic barely instead of Republican. They're also uh, uh, carrying out a bunch of measures of election flat out nullification. They are working up measures whereby um, whole state level electoral slates can be negated by the Republican led state legislature. They are trying to create a, 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 a system that it's just impossible for the Democrats to win um, the 2024 presidential election. And when you think about all the rigging that's going on at the state level and in, in contested states where Republicans have um, a significant amount of power and the likelihood of the Rep of history says the Republicans will come back and take the House of Representatives and perhaps also the Senate in 2022 and certainly in 2024, Republicans have a good shot at the Senate. The likelihood uh, of a Democrat squeaking by in the popular vote and or the electoral or, or in, the, in, the, in the all important electoral college vote, but then Congress refusing to certify and it getting thrown back into the House of Representatives or to the Supreme Court and handed to the GOP is extremely high. There's a there's a coordinated assault on a normal bourgeois Democratic election in 2024. And the chances of Republicans coming back to power are very good. What happens in the red states uh, um, does not just stay in the red states and they know it. And so they're, they know that a lot of, of stuff full of national political implications is going on in the red states. You know, when you, when you, the, the Texas abortion bill and all the other abortion bills like the Mississippi one, which is coming up to the, um, which is coming up to the US Supreme Court very soon. Uh, the, the, the Mississippi abortion bill is crafted in such a way as to compel the Supreme Court to, which is now 6-3 right wing, to abolish the right to abortion on a national level. The Texas abortion bill was structured in such a way as to make anyone liable for a $10,000 or more lawsuit for aiding anyone in the country for aiding an abortion in Texas. Uh, when you uh, uh, blow up public health protections, masking and vaccines in Iowa, people get COVID and then travel. And they go to the Hawkeye football game in Iowa City, and then they come back to uh, their accounting job in the loop and infect people in the blue state, Chicago. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's all interconnected. Thank you.